This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. We hear in the news about mass shootings occurring in the U.S. For the Christians, how do we respond to these senseless murders when a large percentage of believers favor the Second Amendment, which the media blames for all the killings? Walt Shepard is a pastor, army veteran, and a strong supporter of gun rights. I ask him about his viewpoint regarding what the Bible says about all these issues. What should our response be? I mean, a lot of times we don't hear a Christian response to what's taking place in, in our society in that way. We, we look at the media, the media paints what, we, what they want to paint, and that's mm -hmm. the way we should go and what we should believe. But what do you paint from the pulpit? What do you, what do you, what do you deliver there? Well, I, I, think, I think first of all, you have to understand, you know, before response is calls, and then understand the calls needs, to, the response needs to come to the calls. What, what is the cause of this? Why, why are we having children killing children and adults killing mm -hmm. children? I mean, we have, we have rape increasing, murders increasing, suicide increasing, theft increasing. I mean, we have a that's, lot. That's in, within the public school. Just within the public school system. So if we just look at the school system, the school shootings, you're saying that all of those areas are increasing, you say? Yes, and, and, and that's indicative, of course, of the times that we're living. The Bible says in 2 Timothy that, that perilous times shall come. Mm -hmm. Men shall be lovers of themselves, covetous, boasters, proud, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. And then it says, without natural affection. I mean, when someone can go in and, and a Sandy Hook and kill a, a child with, with, and, and with, with no Five affection. Five or six-year-old. A six-year-old child, an innocent child. We, we have, that, that is a, uh, that's a level, that's a Bible prophecy. It is without natural affection. So we, we have an increase of this. You think about, you think about this, Bob. The average kid uh, watching TV today before they're 12 years old, has seen 8,000 murders on TV. Before they're 12. Before they're 12 years old. Now, now you, you get, yeah. when, when they get to 18, of course, the amount of illicit sex that they've seen, pornography they've been exposed to. I mean, the, the, the Bible says evil communications corrupt good manners. So the, the, the worse communication that they get, it corrupts how they, how they interact with their peers, and they do things to their peers and without any thought of any consequence. The response we get, depending on what the shooting is, depending on where it is, and, and it's, it's always politicized, mm -hmm. and the, the response we get is, we gotta get rid of guns. So we, we, get, we get rid of a weapon, do we still have the cause? Do we still have the, 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 the crime that's going on in schools? Do we find, is there some other, what, what do we have to take care of here? It's, yeah, not, yeah. it's not taking care of the, the implement. Yeah. When a strong, when a, you know, the Bible says when a strong man is armed, he keepeth his goods in peace. <laughs> so, the, the, okay, the unfortunate thing about this is that we have a, a moral decline and, mm -hmm. and, a, and a, less, uh, a, a less appreciation for life. You know, and, and that's not going to change. Biblically speaking, that's not, unless we have a revival and yeah. we have parents to get back. So that's not changing. So that's on a course of destruction. However, what do we do as Christians? I mean, what, what is our response? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, I advocate having some type of, of, of stronger security in the school systems that would not allow the weapons to get into the doors of the system, of the schools. Mm -hmm. And of course, having armed teachers, having armed guards inside the school protecting the soft targets, mm -hmm. our kids. Just shifting gears a little bit, what do you, what do you, what should our message be to uh, our children in a, in, a, in, a, in a church or in a, in a school? What should our message be to those kids when they see these things to keep them from being fearful? Right. Although we need to be cautious and they should be aware, but how do we send them off to, to a public school without fear? Yeah, but that's why well, I tell you what, when, there's, when you wake up in the morning as a child and you go to school and a school shooting took place somewhere else in America the day before, of course it's on their mind. You know, that is a hard thing to address. I mean, I don't really know. Do that shield them from that news? I don't, can, think, can you? I don't think you can. I mean, because the kids are going to, at the school will talk about it. You can't keep them from under, you know, seeing the times that they're living. And to say, I'm going to pray for you, God will protect you. We don't, there's been a lot of Christian kids that have been killed Absolutely. in Columbine. We, we read the stories of yes. Christian kids that almost sacrificed themselves yeah. Yeah. to protect others. And they had a great Christian testimony. Yeah. I'm sure their parents prayed for them that morning. Yeah. Yeah, I, and, I, and I would say this, I mean, you look, at the, you, you, you look at the immediate fear, but the bigger picture is, you know, Satan is a murderer from the beginning, 
Yes. You know, and these people that come into these schools, they're hearing voices. They're under the influence of some type of, 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 um, of spiritual darkness to be able to do what they, mm-hmm. they do to other, pe- other children, other kids. So the, 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 enemy, the enemy, although there's physical manifestations of that enemy through a person carrying a gun into a... Yeah. But the real enemy is the darkness, the prince. And we, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers, against the principalities of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. And so the, 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 the church needs to, to, to be the light in this world and, and reach children to, to say there's a better way. You, you don't have to. And you know, we, can, we can lay it. There's video games that they watch. And I do believe this. I think... I think what people watch on TV, what the parents let their kids watch on TV, there's video games that, oh. you know, I, I was, as a pastor, you get all kinds of stuff. Yeah. There's a, they have download these free games on their devices. And one of those, ripping a person apart in a torture chamber as a game. And I said, what, what is this? I mean, these are, and, and you do that and desensitize yourself yeah. to any value of life. The whole culture is kind of spinning into a, a chasm of darkness. And, and I believe it's orchestrated by, yeah. by the enemy. And there, there, there are kids that will say, I, teenagers that I've, that I've talked to, and they play something like Mortal Kombat or one of these games that's very, very violent. You know, you've been in the military. You know how violent what violence really is. Yes. But these kids are watching these games that can be very, very realistic. Yes. They say, well, it's not going to affect me. I don't want to go out and kill anybody. But we're talking about a wide universe of, of children watching this yes. or teenagers watching yes. this. And out of that universe, there are, there are, there are children that are going to be affected by that. Yes. Yes. Should there be regulation? I mean, we already say, well, there's, I, I, there's, there's mature audiences and there's, there's <laughs> PG. And we know that that, that does not work. Yeah, I, you know, there, there's that line of free speech and regulating yeah. content to, to children. We, we already do it with, we should, with, with pornographic material under mm-hmm. 18. You know, it's, it's, it's bad for anyone. I understand yep. that. But why not do that for, for content that would, would be endorsing the taking of a life, the mercilessly taking of a life, killing somebody, um, hijacking a plane or, or, or taking a, a, a car th- and, and stealing it and, and being in opposition to the authority, the police. I mean, we should regulate this stuff. We should have our video game producers come back to the table and say, hey, what are we doing to our kids? What, what are we doing do to the people, minds of our children? Do, We're putting this into somebody's mind. Do the producers, do the, does Hollywood really not think that it's going to affect? Uh, they, they can't. They, they honestly cannot ignore. They cannot ignore the statistics. Uh, they, they can't ignore the content and, and what what the content is doing to the kids. Um, you can't separate what the reality of a child is and what the real reality mm-hmm. is. The kids many times cannot separate that. And uh, and when they're playing games and they're watching programs, so they're uh, they're in kind of a, a mode of, of media communication that is anything but godly. It, it, it's going to affect them. They cannot separate many times that reality. And, they, and, it, and it, it's not game over and you start again. Yeah. You know, it's, you know, you lost your... Okay, you give you a case in point. There was a, uh, there was a, uh, a YouTuber going through depression. This is just recently went online and said, hey, thumbs up or thumbs down, D or L, death or life. In other words, she's going to want to kill herself, and she was looking at the thumbs up or the thumbs down. She was letting social media vote for for her own life. And I believe the statistic was 78% of her friends online, or the ones that (laughs) followed her, had a thumbs up on her taking her own life. What, what Ah. What are we coming to when we have that kind of... That kind of community on the dark on the web that's allowing this kind of loss of life without any understanding that that person's not coming back. Is is it really because we think that it's that it is uh, fantasy that there is game over and you and you reboot right and there's it's a fantasy thing but but it's so easy to get I mean as a parent uh, to get down and and hopeless and. What can you tell parents right now? I mean, to give them the hope that yeah, I can't have an impact here. Yeah, I, things can change. Yeah, and I, I would say I think I think we need we need to come back to the uh, to the Bible. I think we need to come back. Our legislators are, uh, you know, they need to come back to the Bible. We need to um, from a grassroots effort. We need to have legislators in offices that can impact the laws of the land. But our Second Corinthians five, five we Second Corinthians uh, uh, seven fourteen. We've got it. 
Second Chronicles seven fourteen. We got to come back to God. We have we the church has mm -hmm. to humble. We need to turn from our wicked ways. We need we need our land healed. Our land is sick. Yeah. Uh, the morals of our land is is corrupted. Uh, we we are no different than most of the nations in human history that have gone down yeah. this road, and so we, we the church needs to come back to, hey, we're not playing church anymore. We're coming, submitting ourselves to a holy God. Regardless of your viewpoint on our rights in this country, one thing remains: the U.S. is still blessed compared to the persecuted church overseas. It's estimated this month over 300 Christians will be killed for their faith in countries hostile towards Christianity. Rod Henry is the host of Bible Discovery TV, and he recently joined me in a discussion about a topic we're both passionate about, the tragedy of the persecuted church. Something you probably haven't heard on broadcast news in a long, long time is the persecuted church or the slaughter of Christians around the world. And I, and I don't even say that lightly. The slaughter is probably understating it. It is. And you don't hear it on the news and with me is Rod Hembry and, and one, of, one of the things that really gets to your heart is, is seeing the persecution of Christians around the world. I remember when I was young, um, I was about nine years old and I was walking home from Sunday school and our pastor, our youth pastor, our kids pastor, did a service uh, for the kids on the persecuted church. And um, I remember thinking, in those days, he did it on Russia because we were raising yeah. money for a Russian missionary. And we're talking back in the 70s. And uh, yeah. I remember being so struck by that, and I walked home, hey, and people I... People are really dying? You know, that's exactly dying. what I, I said. Yeah, are they really I, dying? Like, what's because happening? Because of their belief? I was totally yeah. struck by it, and it really bothered me over the course of several days. The Lord really put into my heart the reality of what it means mm -hmm. to, to believe in Him, and to love Him, and to know Him, and be persecuted for that, economically, or socially, or, or whatever. Yeah. Imprisonment with your life. Pri exactly. Yeah. And so I, I became aware of the persecuted church. And then later on, when I got into ministry and started doing the things, it, it has always been a serious part of my life. Persecution has gotten worse mm -hmm. and worse yeah. and worse. And now it's the worst it's ever been. It, yeah, in, any time in history. Any time in history. And what amazes me is we've got a 24-hour news cycle going on. I mean, you, and you think if you were a producer, you've been a television producer. Yeah. If you were a producer of a, of a news show, you think, i got 24 hours to fill. If it bleeds, it leads. Yeah. I'm going to go to this persecuted church because they're, they're slaughtering people in Nigeria. Yeah. But they don't do it. They don't why, do it. Why are, Christians, why are Christians fair game and fair bait and we don't even want to pay attention to them? We'll talk about... Uh, a synagogue shooting, or we'll talk about a mosque shooting, but wiping out entire villages in Africa, we hear nothing. Yeah, 250 villages that we can count, that we know. Um, and the, the thousands, thousands yeah. of Christians that were killed because of that just recently. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and if, if it wasn't for people like the Voice of the Martyrs or, or, or who bring it to like light, that, yeah, exactly, you would you would not know it. You would not know it. And and you know you hear more about the fifty people here or the twenty people there or the school shootings or. And I understand yeah, that. And it's not, I'm not happy that anybody dies. Yeah. But when you have thousands of people who are being slaughtered simply because yeah. they believe in Jesus Christ, they refuse to renounce Him. Mm -hmm. That is stunning. And the news doesn't report it because the news, yeah. I don't know what. I think it's a spiritual thing. They don't, I don't get it. And uh, the news. Well, it has to be. It's it be, has it's to be. It's got to be a kingdom of darkness. Of course. It's, it's either, either set out to intentionally deceive or there's just a, a blindness that they don't see. Absolutely. When I, what I really uh, appreciate about the Bible is the Bible speaks about it. And in Revelation, it talks mm -hmm. about this. And we read through Revelation. We have the two witnesses and all of that. But then suddenly... Jesus Christ says there is, tells John, he says, listen, suddenly there was a group of people that he saw and they were the people who were under the altar uh, and they come up and they say, how long, long Lord, how long? how long? And the Lord says just a little bit longer and gives them white robes and tells them just to hold on. God sees it, regardless of whether CNN reports it or Fox News says anything about it, God sees sees it. So God is going to justify everything at the end of time because he's perfect. But we have to understand as believers, as people who have made the Lord the Lord of our life, that we have to, wherever we can, Voice of the Martyrs, Open Doors Ministries, whatever, whoever it is, we need to be a part of it and we need to understand what's going on and we need to pay attention to it and pray for the people. But again, it's over there. 
it's it's them, and I'm not seeing a lot of it. Uh, what what happens in, if, if something like this begins in North America? Well, if it be, it's it's actually starting, mm -hmm. and the preliminary stages are beginning to set their course. Right. And I think this is exactly what happens when you don't pay attention to it, when you don't pray and ask right. God to do something and get involved. Mm -hmm. It starts to happen. If I can control what you speak and then the you words you say, I can control what you think exactly. and eventually control what you believe. Exactly right. And we see that, we see that so slowly, but it's, but it's happening today. But we're not being persecuted. I mean, we, we've, got the, we've got the great life here in, the nor in North America. Of course you do. I mean, if we were in China or we were in Bulgaria or w back in the day or we were in North Korea or in Africa right now where the, the, the Islam is coming down into Southern Africa, uh, we would have to be real Christians. I had a story, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I had a story of a person who came back from China. They live in Tulsa and uh, they went to China and they were bringing over money for the people mm -hmm. to, because they were suffering and uh, they still suffer in China to a large amount, the largest church in the world over there, and they still suffer. And so they brought them in and they had a group of people, about 30 or 40 people, and they said, good, we can give you money. And the people kind of looked at him strange, and they said, well, can we have your Bible? And he was shocked. And he said, well, yeah, you can yeah. serve the Bible. And all the people gathered around the Bible. He had a Chinese Bible with him that somebody had given him, and he gave that to them. And so then he called immediately, and he said, we need to get like Bibles. Bibles. We need 50 Bibles here now. And he, he worked it out, and within two hours, they were able to manipulate the, the way, the path that it goes, and they had to go through a different area and all that stuff. And they got the Bibles in there. And you know what? They didn't want the money. They wanted the, the Bibles Bible. yeah. because they hadn't got the Bible. Yeah, and I've heard stories in, in the old Soviet Union where you give somebody a page, yeah. one page. I, I give them the book of Jude, you know, just tear out one page. Yeah. And, and, and they, they, they cherish that. And that, that's all the Word of God that they've got at that time. That's they, it. They cherish that. And we are so swamped in Bibles and Bible teaching shows. and We're trying and to get people to read it, you know. And television and churches all over the place. The other... W what do we do before it's too late? Well, we, you know, that's a good question. I think the question, the, the thing that we need to do is the Christians in North America need to start saying, okay, you know what, I'm going to read the Bible and Lord, I'm going to pray. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pray for all the people around the world who are suffering. Right. And, Everybody and, should and, pray every day right. for them. And try to understand, or em not just empathy, but try to understand what that is when they do suffer. They're of not, course. They, they will not renounce the name of Christ. They may have their head taken off. They may have their children killed in front of them. Their we've got to understand, off. we've got to understand what that persecution really is. We have to understand it. We have to learn it. We have to ask the Lord, Lord, help us to get it. And because that's prayer. our brother or our sister getting their head right. taken off. That's our brother or our sister suffering over there. Now, we may not be our brother and sister, but the, the Bible and the that's Word right. of God and you into my heart, you into their heart, has made me their brother. And to, and to, and to take them to to the Lord in prayer. Absolutely. Yeah, we need church. to pray like never before from the Word of God. We need to say, Lord, help the people. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't, I'm telling you, God says, and this is a little bit about the judgment seat of Christ. It's great. It's not about salvation. But God says, what did you do with what yeah. I gave you? What exactly. did you do with what I gave exactly. you? See, that's the judgment seat of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so if we understand mm -hmm. that we have to answer that, then we need to say, okay, Lord, I, I read your Bible. I didn't understand every word, but I read it, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to understand it. And if we say, I prayed for the people, I couldn't do much, but I prayed for them, then that's something that I want to answer <laughs> at the judgment yeah. seat of Christ. Able, yeah. a well done, faithful yeah, servant, right. good and faithful servant. <laughs> we undertook, we, we interceded for, the, for those we did. who are suffering. And we did. And they're suffering today, and we've got to encourage you out there we need to intercede. We need to pray. We need to know that word. And, and you're doing this every day. Yeah, we are. We're doing that every day. Every day. And, uh, it's, but again, the persecuted church, we need the people to grab hold of this and, and say, I've got to do that. Right. Because that's a cause that needs to be addressed mm -hmm. in prayer. Yeah, and we're not going to hear it from the government. We're not going to hear it from the media. We've got to hear it from Christians got to sound the alarm. Get a hold of voice, go to the Voice of the Martyrs, go to Open Doors Ministries, mm -hmm. whatever. Just go there and get all of the information the and, and use that the truth. as a regular basis in your prayer. The American church may be complacent to the tragedy of Christian persecution. 
When you hear that a recent survey revealed over 40% of evangelical Christians believe non-Christian faith can lead to eternity with God. Author and speaker Sean McDowell has some strong viewpoints on how so many Christians can believe in a liberal gospel that's not supported by the Bible. There's a, uh, a, a study, and I'm, I can't quote the study itself, it says a majority of all American Christians, 52% Christians, think that at least some non-Christian faith can lead to eternal life. That indeed among Christians who believe many religions can lead to eternal life, 80% name at least one Christian faith that can, or one non-Christian faith that can do that. Whether it's Hinduism or Buddhism or Islam, but these are American Christians. Uh, what's, what's our issue here? I mean, uh, we think that Christianity is just too narrow? Well, when you talk about Christians, I think the problem is that Christians don't really understand the gospel. We don't really understand why it is that Jesus is the only way. Mm -hmm. And in the minds of a lot of people who call themselves Christians, they think God looks down and goes, oh, I like this club, I don't like that club. But the reason Jesus is the only way is he's the only one who fixed the problem of separated separating God and man, namely sin. I mean, if you think, if your car runs out of gas, it's not going to do any good to rotate the tires. You've got to identify the problem and fix it. The problem is sin, and Jesus is the only one who paid for sin. So I don't think a lot of people who consider themselves Christians really understand the gospel and the claims that Jesus himself made. So when they believe that uh, there's a really good Hindu, he does all things well, it doesn't hurt anybody, doesn't hate anybody, he lives this, what they would consider almost a sinless life, there's still no answer for the real sin in his life, that he's, he's born into sin. Well, I don't know that anybody lives an almost <laughs> sinless life, right? But that's they, what they, they think. Would, like you said, there still would be sin in that person's life. Mm -hmm. And if Romans 3 is correct, and I believe it is, my goodness, read Romans 3. How it describes the human heart rebelling, falling away from God. What Jesus talked about in Mark 7, it's out of the heart that comes lies and comes adultery and comes pride and lust and sloth. I mean, the heart is broken and in rebellion against God. So that's why Jesus pointed back to the human heart that needs transformation from within. And all our good deeds and efforts cannot get us to God. It can't atone for our sins. So when we're preparing a, a, a Generation Z or when we're preparing a, a, a current high schooler uh, to really develop that worldview, a Christian worldview, does that, does that still seem too narrow for them? I mean, in today's culture, it seems like we've got diversity, we want diversity, we want everybody to be happy. How do we prepare that student for that, uh, to, to answer that question? Well, that's a great question, and I actually don't think it's just for Gen Zers. One of the biggest virtues we're told to believe today is inclusiveness mm -hmm. and the idea that jesus is the only way strikes a lot of people including many young people as sure. being exclusive and i think part of this is to point out that jesus reached out to everybody christianity is inclusive for anybody regardless of race regardless of gender socioeconomic status how much money they have where they're from their job jesus reached out to everybody it's truly inclusive and other religions I could point to, I won't right now, are actually not as inclusive as that. So I want to point people back to Jesus and say he's calling everybody to love and follow him. And he backed it up with evidence by fulfilling prophecy, doing miracles, and rising on the third day. Well, what's the best way for a parent to, to begin that conversation, begin that relationship? I, maybe it is a relationship with their own son or daughter. On Christianity, sometimes they think, well, I can talk to my kids about other things, but I, I don't want to push them away from, from my faith. Therefore, I'm not, I'm not equipped to, to address this. What's the best way for them to start that? Well, in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 7, the Shema, it talks about love, Lord God, your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. Mm -hmm. Talk about this when you walk on the road, when you lie down, and, of course, when you get up and when you're around the home. In other words, make talk about god and spiritual things a natural part of the rhythm of life if we completely ignore it we're sending a message to our kids that god is not a part of our lives if we're talking about it every second we'll probably exasperate our kids so really the principle is to make god a natural part of the rhythm of life and there's ways to do this at the dinner table that's at least a little bit natural there's ways to do this uh, if you're driving in the car, over movies that you watch together. Really what we lay out in the book is what are some practical strategies to have these spiritual conversations with kids 
where it feels like it's not overbearing. And one of those principles, you just reminded me of that uh, in the book, is that be ready to give two whys for every what. I mean, when mm -hmm. you're talking to a, a student or a child about, about what they, they believe or what you believe, to give two whys. Give me an example of that. Well, this is something my co-author came up with, and I love it. A ton of people have asked about it because when kids ask a question, we tend to just say, well, here's what you're supposed to believe. But that's not enough for this generation. Yeah. We have to help them understand why it's true and why it matters for their life. So I was speaking at a conference maybe six or eight weeks ago with my dad, an entire weekend on biblical sexuality. And a 12 or 13-year-old kid came up to me, he goes, man, my whole life I've been told that sex outside of marriage is bad and I shouldn't look at pornography, but nobody told me why I shouldn't and why God's plan is best for me. That's exactly what we have to do to make it move just from an idea to a conviction that they really hold and believe. And you can do this any place. Like you say, when you're lying down, when you're sitting up, when you're eating, you, a, a parent can take that two whys for every what. And it, especially when the, kid, when the child asks a question, when they, when they open it up with a question about their, about their faith. That's right. The, the, the idea is to just look for natural moments to have spiritual conversation. So my son, a little while ago, wanted to see this movie, Bohemian Rhapsody. And it was about the rock band yeah. Queen. Yeah. And had some things, a little objectionable. I said, tell you what, he was 14. I'll take you and a buddy whose parent approves if when we're done, we just come back and just talk about it for 30 minutes over the dinner table. He goes, sure. So we went to see the movie and we came back and we just literally, t I didn't lecture him. We talked about how should we think about it as Christians? What was good in the film? Where did you feel like they were preaching at you? Could the film have been better? What'd you learn? And we just discussed it relationally to help him think Christianly. That, that's that, 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 this key to what, one of the things you said here, the, the developing a relationship with this generation, what's going to make it vital is not lecturing, but really developing the relationship and listening. That's Big right. difference between lecturing and listening. Huge difference <laughs> between lecturing and listening. We have to listen in a way where we're not quick to judge because right. this, this generation feels like if you're judging them, they're going to close down. So there's a way to listen without saying I'm affirming a different belief system or choices, but I'm affirming you as a person. That's the key. Well, there's, there's so much more to, to be mined from the book so the next generation will know. Matter of fact, uh, Lee Strobel, he's a, he's a best-selling author as well, he says, this may be the most important Christian book of the year. What's more vital than understanding how to teach the truth of Christianity to the next generation? Thank you for making it available, Sean. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on, Bob. Now in our second season, Viewpoint is hitting more topics head-on than ever this year. Every Viewpoint program is produced without any commercial advertising, but we couldn't do this show without the support of our financial partners, and it only takes a minute to give. Go to WTLW.com and click Get Involved, then Donate. Your gift of $20, $50, or even $100 will help continue the outreach of TV44's Viewpoint program to impact your hometown and the world. Coming up on Viewpoint with Bob Placey. I really want people to understand how government works on the inside with this book so that they can be more effective. I'm Bob Placey. Thanks for joining me today. Remember, you can share all the Viewpoint interviews you've seen today online at YouTube. And you can listen to the Viewpoint podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and anywhere you can listen to a podcast. <laughs>